can you please take us through the process of today? May God bless you and may God be with you right now as you deliver the message of God. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to all of my brothers and sisters, particularly in uh, South Africa, and those of you watching us around the world. We welcome you again to day six of our time together. It's been such a wonderful time. The time goes by so fast. We're gonna savor every minute, every moment. I will never forget this. Hope to see you guys someday. All of the uh, faces that are hidden behind the camera I cannot see. Uh, one of these days we will get to see each other. Let's go strictly to the uh, word. Every uh, night we have been dealing with the, the theme made for more. And uh, every night we have a subtopic under that theme. We started with the intentions of creation. We are included, uh, perceive to possess, out of focus, glued together by gratitude. And tonight, an old story, new perspectives. An old story, new perspective. Father in heaven, speak to our hearts and may the heart of all of your children, the weight of this internet, be opened to your word this morning for them in South Africa, this afternoon for those in different parts of the world, maybe this evening for some of us who are over in the West. We thank you for your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. A new story, a new perspective. We started this week with the story of creation. And we talk about how God created man in this, the sixth day of the week. Before God brought us into this world, God decided to fix everything to our liking. Everything that we needed to survive in this world, God took five days to create everything that was needed. Everything that we we'll ever need for making our life easier on planet Earth. When God made all of these things, these things, He created everything. And in each day that He completed a creation, He would say, It is good, it is good, it is good. And then on the day that He actually created the crown joy of all of His creation, the genius of all His creation, all put together, God took a lump of clay and put himself into that lump of clay, the breath of himself. He poured himself into man. And the Bible says, man became a living soul. Man became a vessel through which God dwells. So as the story goes, in the cool of the evening, God will visit his crown joys of creation, Adam and Eve. But then one day, Adam and Eve decided to listen to a different voice other than the creator. And when they did that, the guilt filled their hearts. In fact, they were surrounded with self-preservation now rather than the glory of God. They hid themselves when God came looking for them. And God said, Adam, Adam, where are you? I don't see you in the usual place where we're supposed to meet. Adam said, oh, Lord, I'm not there. I hid myself. Why? Why did you hide yourself? Well, I hid myself because, you know, the woman you gave me. Have you eaten of the fruit? God asked him. And ever since that time, the enemy of our soul and the enemy of our God have placed our honor, the, honor the belief that we were created to be less than who we really are. And for 4,000 years, we accepted our reality. And we live that reality. And after 4,000 years, Jesus had to come, gone through all of that. And 
even after Christ came and went still. When you study a new science that just started, people just started looking at it since the 1990 called the quantum physics. One of the things that I learned from the quantum physics and I love science, it says that um, if you took the particles or the, the, the stuff that the, 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 the uh, quantum physics made or is light, photon. If you took the photon, it was, scientists took one light, the photon, they took it, they divided it into two, and they shot one seven miles in, in the east and seven miles in the west. Opposite direction, they were about this time 14 miles apart from one another. And what was um, incredible is that whatever was done to one on the other side was simultaneously done to the other one on the other side with no time lapsing behind. There were no time lapse because in the universe, in God's scheme of things, whenever God is involved, time and distance disappear. They all collapse into oneness. And so, when Jesus now, because we were created by God and he made himself one with us, and then sin tried to separate us, but the, act, the fact of the matter, we were still not separated. The separation was all in the mind of man. I told you last night, the, the strongest elevator emotion that can pull everything you imagine in your life, that can pull it right into your being, right into your orbit, is gratitude. Now that I'm going to tell you, and the, the, the strongest, the strongest one that will stop a cold is called guilt. Guilt is the one thing that allows you to project your own feeling towards God. And everything that we have learned, religion has brought the ugliness of God. When you read the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, it looks that we have a God who was merciless, a God who was always looking to zap those people who have done wrong. In the New Testament, it's a little different, though, because Jesus has come. Jesus came. He came to show to us the true characteristics of who God is. First Corinthians. 13 verse 5 said, love keeps no record of wrongdoing. So if God doesn't keep it, there is only one place kept. It's in your mind. It is in our head. And that wrongdoing, the record of that wrongdoing, create guilt. And the guilt is the one that put a a land of demarcation between us and God. And because of that guilt, we don't even know how to approach God. We don't even know how to come to God. We don't even know how to pray. Because when we go to pray, some of the prayer that I hear from some of our Adventist author, when you hear our elder praying, or they're going, they know all week they're going to pray. Then it's, they get on the altar, they say, oh, Father, you know I'm not worthy to pray, to intercede on behalf of these people. I am sinner. I'm, if you are that way, you feel that way, tell the pastor or the program planner, I don't want to pray. You see, the guilt that we carry always separate us from God. And so Jesus came, and in his effort to try to show to us the oneness the same behind the relationship that exists between us, Jesus wanted to show it, and he was doing it in so many different ways, but man did not even know that he was made to do more. The reason Jesus came as a man is that Jesus came as a man because it's man that he tried to redeem. He tried to show to us what we can do if we just watch him and do what he does. Jesus was a man. 100% man, but then Jesus was also God in the flesh. As you are God's anointed, when you become God's anointed and you become adopted, you are a child of God in the flesh. So one day Jesus, but, but, but this, this reality had disappeared from our psyche and because religion, 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 religion has done something evil to us because religion brings a lot of rules and they're done, the do's and don'ts and they never tell us what it is that we're supposed to do. Religion stifle us with all, set, all types of rules and we make God look 
like a master who was just sitting there when I first came into the Adventist church. Every Sabbath school, I had a, I had a Sabbath school teacher who always been teaching. When they were teaching the investigative judgment, they talk about it. I said, God was just sitting on his throne, looking around to see who is going to do wrong so you can zap them. I used to be so afraid of this investigative judgment until when I started it, then I found out that the Bible said the hour of his judgment has come. It does not say the hour of our judgment. God is the one on trial because the enemy of our soul has accused him of being unfair. We are made the witnesses in this warfare, in this code room, the drama code room. We are the one who's supposed to testify that God is good and he better than good. And so God sent his son to show what man can accomplish, what God can accomplish in the body of man. If we would just acknowledge a present in our being, we can accomplish everything that Jesus has accomplished. So one day Jesus is giving a story now and notice how the story goes. It's an old story. And all of us have heard sermon on this story. It's an old story. And Jesus carefully selected his audience. He selected the audience that much, much resemble uh, the self-righteous people in the church. The self-righteous who always think that they are better than other people else. And so God, Jesus selected this audience. It was an audience of the Jewish fathers, the Jewish father, and these Jewish father, they were all orthodox Jews. And one day Jesus began to tell them a series of parables. And then he came to the third parable and he started talking about a man who had two sons. And then he said, one of the sons, the youngest of the son came and said to the father, father, give me the part of your goods Give me the part of your estate that belongs to me. You will find that in um, you will find that in Luke chapter fifteen. Luke chapter fifteen, and you it begin from verse eleven. Say, Father, give me the portion of good that belongs to me. And why he asked for it? Now notice the audience that Jesus is speaking to. He's speaking to the Jewish Orthodox fathers. And these are men in their culture, they understand that all the thing that belongs to the father belongs to the son, they know that. But what they cannot tolerate, which is taboo in that culture, is the fact that if the child comes and try to ask for it in advance, it is as if the child is saying, father, in my mind, you are dead. Because you see these goods, don't belong to the child. I mean, the child cannot possess them exclusively until after the death of the father. So by their boy going to go ask his father to give him his portion of something he didn't work for, it's as if he is saying to the father, you are dead in my mind. That is a taboo. That is a no-no. And Jesus intentionally and deliberately gave the story. And as Jesus gave the story, you can imagine the grumbling and rumbling going among those self-righteous father. What manner of boy is there? I will disfellowship. In fact, I will disown you. I will excommunicate him in the heartbeat. He will never be a part of my son anymore. They are saying that in their mind as Jesus continued with the story. And then Jesus blew their mind by saying, and the father gave the boy all that he asked for. What? He must not be a Jewish father, they may think in their mind. And then the boy, Jesus continued the story, the boy gone into a far country and he used this, all of the wealth, he wasted it on rioter living, the Bible said. He wasted it. And after he wasted it, a farming came to the land. Now Jesus is getting into the territory that pleases his audience now. The audience, they are, their, their ear popped now to listen. What is farming in the land? Nobody would give this boy anything to eat. The boy was so hungry, he was almost dying. Now to themselves, they say, good for him. Good. God is punishing him for being a rude child. In fact, I will never accept that boy in my home again. You, can you hear that? Can you hear those self-righteous father talking, casting their judgment on this boy already? And then Jesus twisted the story, and Jesus is a master of twist and turn. And Jesus said, and he ended up in a pig pen, he started eating there, and while he was doing that, he said, boy, wait a minute, 
my father is still alive. In my father's house, my father's servant get more to eat than, I mean, to spare. And I'm here hungry. I'm going to go to my father. Oh, no. The, the audience went, oh, no. He ain't coming nowhere. He's not coming anywhere. You kidding me? After he had done all the work he did to say he come out, they say I would get my, my devil barrel gun and shotgun and I would wait for that, but I would kill him myself. He would not even get near to my, he would not even enter my property because as far as I'm concerned, he's not a son. You can hear that with those self-righteous fathers sitting on there. Now the, 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 the glory now in the suffering of the boy, the glory now because you see the boy deserve it. That kind of projection we put on God. And so Jesus is still telling the story and the boy is coming home. And at this time, all of the fathers, all the audience, they are sitting at the edge of their seat. They are sitting at the edge of the seat. They're getting ready now to see what the father does. In fact, they already concluded what the father is going to do. They concluded the father is going to blow this boy out of, out of his way. They concluded that already. They just wanted it to be told. As Jesus tells the story, and Jesus said, and the father looked down the road, and he saw the son. And Jesus said, and he ran to his son. And they thought, yes, he ran into him to throw him out of the property. And instead, he put his arm around the son. Oh, by this time, the Jewish, the audience is getting ready to just get up and leave. What kind of men be, pan be? What kind of weak father this is? I mean, he must not be a Jewish father. I want you to understand that I'm dramatizing this because I want you to understand what was going on, why Jesus was telling this story. It was intentional. And then the father instructed his servant to bathe this boy, put the best rope on him, put a, a signal ring on his finger and all of that, making him look that he was a king or the prince. And they killed the fattest cow. And as they celebrated, other brother came home. The brother knows now what's going on. He's angry. And he says to his father, listen to this and we'll get to the heart of this thing. Father, I've been with you all this time. I've been obedient to you. I've done everything. But as this is your son, the one who took everything. He went lavish it with prostitute. The one who just went away. You not celebrating. You never celebrated giving me a young good once so my friends and myself can celebrate. And the father is shocked. The father said, do you mean that son? You mean all this son, the hard work that you are doing? You mean all the things you've been doing around this house and around this yard? You mean everything you have been doing? You've been doing that to win my love for you? Didn't you know that you are already loved by virtue of the fact that you are my son? I love you because you are my son. And everything I have is already yours. Since when did you have to ask permission to use what is already yours? What? Everything I have is yours. And so what Jesus was doing was throwing the light on the Father. Jesus was saying that contrary to all that you have heard about your heavenly Father, I'm here to tell you that your heavenly Father is not what you have heard that he is. Your heavenly Father is a gracious and a loving God. Merciful. His love had no end. It's unconditional. That is the God that you have as your father. Whenever you have done wrong, the, the wrong deed is always recorded in your own mental record. It's never in the record of God's brain. God said, God said in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, I know the thought that I have towards you. It's not a thought to harm you. I want to bring you to your expected end. You see, because before you were formed in your mother's womb, I already knew you. I knew exactly what your end was going to be like. It's a beautiful end. And I want to guide you to that end. Because I'm the God. I'm the God who, who can can declare the end from the beginning, meaning I'm the God who finish what I want to do before I start doing it. Woo! I am the God who begin, who finishes my project, and then I begin to do it and work towards the finish line that is already done. God does not, let me repeat this. 
Nothing. He said he wished above that none should perish. It is a desire that none of us perish. God's desire is for us to make it. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to show us, not only to die on the cross. Oftentimes we talk about the death on the cross and we fail to talk about the life. Jesus didn't just come to die. Jesus came to show us how to live, to live abundant life. He came to show the passion of the father and how merciful he is. And that's why he told this story. The story. All of us, even some of us, Ellen White said, there are many of us who sometimes God fail to answer our prayers because he wants to reveal the evil that lead us to serve him. Because some of us, since we became Christian, everything we ask for, God gives it to us. We ask for whatever God always gives it to us. And so we are accustomed to God doing for us. And so we don't realize that our worship of God is not because of who he is, but it's because of what he can do for us and what he has been doing for us. So, the, so she says, sometimes God will go ahead and not answer our prayer for once so that he can reveal the evil that in our heart that lead us to serve him, an evil desire that lead us to serve him. What is that evil desire? The desire to just have everything from God. We need to know God for who he is and serve him, not because of what he can do, but because of who he is. And this God, I've been submitting him to you throughout this week, that he dwells in you. You and I, we are the address of God. If we just let him live, let him live his life through us from this point on. Even when you do wrong, you come to God, he is always waiting, looking for you to come to your senses. All God wants you to do is for you to realize that there is no other way out but to embrace him because he is that merciful, that gracious, that loving. I don't know who I'm talking to here, uh, but I know I'm probably talking to many of you, almost uh, uh, about nine, 297 of you here tonight. I know that I'm talking to somebody, whether in South Africa, Australia, Canada, United States, or anywhere in the world that you're listening to us. I am talking to you because somehow you have projected your own judgment upon God. And because you have not found a way to forgive yourself, you believe that God will not forgive you. See, all that is in your mind. It's in your mind. God is asking you to come home. He's asking us to come home. He loves us so much, folk. His love for us is so tremendous that he is willing to cast all of our sin in the depth of the sea. And I was told that the, 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 the deepest portion of the ocean is about seven miles deep. That's where God sent our sins. Don't dive. And when he sent the sin, he put a sign, no diving, because he know there are some of you who will quickly dive down there to go pick up the sin that he has already taken up. Tonight, as we go into our different rooms, remember how merciful this God is. Jesus told this story for the reason. The story is to speak to us that there is nothing, all of the sins of humanity on this planet since its inception up until now. And the sins that will be committed with all of the sins of the universe put together cannot even match the grace and love of your savior, Jesus Christ. Can I match it? Can I match it? Your sin cannot withstand God's love. His love for you is bigger than you can describe. It's taller than you can see. It's deeper than you can go. God loves for us is limitless. So tonight the Lord is calling you home. As we come to the conclusion tomorrow night, think about it, sleep over it, pray about it. But remember this as you pray, never pray with guilt. Because guilt is the one thing that will stop you from being grateful, from giving praise and 
thanksgiving to God. And because the enemy knows that it is praise and thanksgiving and gratitude that actually make you and myself more like God. May the Lord bless you. Father in heaven, thank you for your word again tonight. It's been six days now. Thank you. I hope, my Lord, that we have learned something about you this week that we didn't know before. I hope that what we have learned this week has changed our lives because many of us were living our lives in a religious bubble that says that if you do this, God will do that to you. But this six the past six days, we've learned that you are a forgiving God and waiting to forgive us more than we are waiting to sing. Thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you.